Hello? Who is it? Hi. Am I doing, am I, I pressed the, who, hello? Hi. <laughs> hello? Uh, hello? Hi. I pressed record. I'm quarantined. I haven't left the, is, am I, can you hear me? Hello? Who is, hello? Are you there, Jackie? That's what happens when I call my parents. It's like a, it's like a panic that is, I can't hear you. What happened? It's like, uh, so call me, it's fine. Dragcast episode 187. We are talking to Jackie Tone. It's gonna be a really funny episode. I hope you are ready for all the fun we're gonna have with our friend Jackie Tone right here on Dragcast with Nina West. And Patricia Tone! Well, welcome, Jackie Tone. I am thrilled to welcome you to Dragcast with Nina West. Of course, uh, with me as always is Patricia. Patricia, Jackie, say hello. Hi, Jackie. Hello, Patricia, my girl. How are you? Hi. excited you're here. Thanks for doing this. This is going to be a fun-filled hour. I can't wait. <laughs> oh, so Jackie Tone is an actress, comic, singer, songwriter, and show creator. She plays Melrose in the hit Netflix show Glow. She played Gilda Radner in David Wayne's A Feudal and Stupid Gesture or Futile. There you go. I Either think way, both. Play. both play. <laughs> Both play, both play, also on Netflix. Most recently, Jackie, Jackie is the co-creator of an animated preschool musical series called Do Ray and Me for Amazon that she's executive producing and voicing with Kristen Bell, as well as co-writing all of the songs for this series in the 52-episode first season. Hello and welcome, Jackie Tone. Hi. I mean, listen, when you read it like that, I think to myself, who is this gal? It's you. Oh, I like her. And then I go like, oh shit, I've done a thing or two. It's wild to hear it back at you. Well, because you're you're supremely accomplished and you are like, I mean, really, you 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 you've been on this hit Netflix show Glow. You are you are like doing this massive, massive children's project, but we want to start kind of back in the early, early, early part of it all. Like how it's did you weird. how did you it's sorry to interrupt. It's weird. To he, like, I, I still don't like a hundred percent feel like someone's talking about me when they're like, "You're you're accomplished." I'm like, "Who? Did someone? <laughs> did someone else come in? Let me say hi. Who? Like, and I'm like, "Oh, you mean me? <laughs> that's wild." Hi, yeah. No, no, but so okay. Well, then let me ask you that. So when you listen to these accomplishments, really, I mean, you you say it doesn't feel like you, but when you like, what does it make you feel like? I mean, you've done all this work. This is a hustle. Like what I just read to you is a hustle. It's somebody who's like really, really devoted and believes in themselves and is hustling. What does that say to you when you hear it back? I have a lot of answers to that because I only believe in myself sometimes. Um, and I, um, but I believe in myself. I think, I think for me, it feel it just feels amazing. The answer to the question is it, it feels so awesome. And I think, you know, I'm in my late thirties and as a person who has been sort of like in this, in this game, as long as I have been, it's even more wild to hear it back because it's not like I'm, you know, 19 and I just graduated, you know, 18 years graduated from high school. And then I was like, I want to have a career. And then it's now. And I, and all of my dreams have come true. Like I've sort of been pounding the pavement largely fruitlessly for the better part of 25 years. I started mm -hmm. acting when I was nine. Oh, and yeah. so I just like, I, I mean, the truth, the truth of my story is that I, I, I didn't, I didn't really get, I um, mean, I don't mean this to be sad. I just mean this to be like the reality of an, of an actor and a performer in a writer's life. I just really didn't get hired until my mid thirties. <laughs> and I started when I was nine. <laughs> when you did, when you did the nanny, right? Is this, was it, what yeah, were you did the nanny. So there were these things um, you know, I, I did, I, that's the other thing. Like I, I did enough work to sort of go like, okay, I'm not insane. Like, I think I want to be an actor and people are responding to what I'm doing, like at least a little bit. Right. So like I got this, I got a couple episodes of the nanny and I got little things here and there, but there was never that my show or my, you know, or a big movie or anything that made people go like, okay, cool, here's who this girl is. But I was basically like a kid character actor and just getting little jobs here and there where I could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it was a wild childhood that's for sure like fully going on auditions all the time like my mom you know quitting her job so she can schlep me around and take me on auditions all over New York City in the 90s is wild is that so was that was, did, you, did you fall into it because you you wanted this yeah, oh yeah um, my parents are both uh, gym teachers Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So there was nobody in my house that was like, let's make this kid a star. It was only <laughs> Calgon, take me away. And full performing every time I opened my mouth. Like I just pretty much the way I am now. I mean, everything about my life has always been fairly performative. And I've always been some version of a writer and a comic. And my dad is, you know, um, always had aspirations to be a um, a successful musician and you know he plays every instrument and my mom is the funniest person that ever was but there's really no there's there's no you know professional entertainers in my family and certainly nobody that said hey let's make this kid a star I mean it was all me and even now as I'm older I like look back at what my mom I mean of course she loved it and we had a great time and we were like a little comedy team but like what she gave up to to schlep me around and, you know, try and make this happen for me. It's really crazy to think about, actually. Do you think any of that, like, and, and, and as you say that, you know, I because my experience was really different, right? I kind of like had to fight for my parents to really understand that I wanted to be on stage, you know, and that's where I belonged. And that's, you know, you have, I think, yeah, artists. Absolutely. Artists. And that's, and that's unfortunately hugely common. I mean, I, I think honestly, I mean, that's more common than me having parents that my dad was like, nah, she's a star. Like, of, yeah. course, of course. And my mom being like, we got this and taking me on auditions and quitting her job. And, you know, there was a rare pocket of time in the 90s where my dad, we were by no means wealthy, but was making enough money to make it so my mom didn't have to work. He was a school teacher. He was a gym mm-hmm. teacher but he was doing well enough. And I, I mean, I just can't believe really were it not for their sacrifices. I would have none of this. So what you were saying anyway, so your parents. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was just, so I feel like this still this desire to, for me to prove to them yeah. how, how worthy I am of, of this, of this world and this life that I work so hard to have. Yeah. Do you feel like opposite? Do you feel indebted? Maybe, you know, I wonder. Um, well, interesting. I feel both, but I feel the same pressure because they gave up so much for yes. it yeah. possible for me that yeah. it's like, I mean, I have to say I used to confuse my dad's dreams and my dreams. Yes. Like fully confuse them. Like I remember I was I, I, years ago, I had like this 100%, like my number one goal was to sing, cause my dad's an incredible songwriter, was to sing songs my dad wrote at Carnegie Hall and like with a huge orchestra. And though that's a beautiful dream, it's not my dream, it's his dream. Mm-hmm. And so though I would love to be at Carnegie Hall one day and will I sing a song or two of my dad's? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was at that, I was for many years, like, this is for them. This is like, they gave up so much for, to make this possible for me. And now we're all in it together. So I got to make it happen. And that was, Mm -hmm. you know, it's actually, I didn't realize this till an ex-boyfriend pointed it out to me years ago, but it's, it's an enormous amount of pressure as much as it's support and it's how beautiful and how lucky I am. It also to the mind of a child, I mean, it equals like pressure. Like, shit, my mom doesn't have a job because of this. Like, I better, I better get, I better, you know, do well on these things. There's a lot of mm-hmm. stake here, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you, it's so interesting, like that you had this experience. I'm, I am like kind of curious about like how that conversation started. Like, was there an audition or an opportunity that was like, this is the one we got to go for? Um, that's a bunch, that's a many fold answer. So my, <laughs> my, they are all going to be guys. What am I going to, there's not going to be one short. If you're looking for a sound bite, you're going to want to call someone else. I know. This is we why I love that. you. This, I feel like I know you. We're the same I, person. I know, it's just, it, the spiel just goes and I, and I sometimes can catch it, but almost never. So please don't. No. Okay, good. I won't. Um, so the answer is kind of many fold in that 
you know, I guess with anyone's life, if these 17,000 things didn't happen in this order, none of the things would have happened. Kind of butterfly effect vibes. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. My mom's good friend that she literally was in Lamaze with, with, (laughs) with her, with, with this woman's eldest daughter and my biggest brother um, was a sort of local sort of hometown agent in Long Island, New York, and her name's Aggie Gold of Fresh Faces Agency. And um, <laughs> is Fresh Faces still around? Um, she is still around. I think she has a couple clients. She slowed it <laughs> down, but she was like, she represented, Ta- she put Tatiana Ali on the Fresh Prince. Oh, um, wow. She Gar- oh. Oh, no, yes. She put Joanna Garcia all over the map. She put Alec Mappa all over the map. What? She put me all over the map. No, no, she's a beast. So she, I mean, to this day, the best, I mean, she was like my manager, my agent, my, I mean, she was my, she was amazing. Um, But when I moved to LA and she was working out of like her home office in New York, we sort of like, it didn't feel like it made sense to, to keep going. And now I don't, looking back, actually, I don't know that I made the right decision at that time, but in the moment I was like, I'm in LA, I need a big LA agent. And I, I made that change. But the point of that was all to say, she was a big part of it because she knew my mom. So it wasn't this like, oh God, like, are we going to submit to agencies? Like basically we just, my mom just called her and was like, Hey, and she was like, yeah, Jackie's really funny. And she's a piece of work and she's a ham. This was like, I was nine. And she was like, and I sang and I did all this stuff. And she was like, yeah, this is, let's give it a, let's give it a whirl. And we just sort of like jumped in with this working with this woman. And, you know, she wasn't any highfalutin person and I obviously wasn't mm-hmm. killing it, but it was, we were like kind of all getting by. It was like this ragtag group of misfits. Like we'd fly out to LA for pilot season and it was, it was wild. What was the first, what was the first audition? Do you remember, do you remember, was it like, what was the first thing you went up for? I can't, you know, it's really, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that, which is like <laughs> insane. <laughs> I I don't know. I remember I'm, one of the earliest ones is I think I was like, because I was on the nanny when I was 12 and I'd been going on auditions for like a year before that and doing extra work to get my SAG card. I just really um, wanted it to be like Annie and like, I wanted like little Jackie well, seeing her kind of, life. It kind of was, because when I was really young, I was trying out for, like, The Goodbye Girl on Broadway and trying yeah. for Gypsy the TV movie, where Natalie Portman taught me how to time step. That's a true story. <laughs> what? That's a true story. So um, I don't think she got it either, actually. Um, <laughs> Eden Regal got it. This this girl that was, like, the sort of the Broadway kid. When we were all, when we were little, Eden Regal got everything. <laughs> uh, there's always that one now, uh, look at, uh, now where is she now she's probably Eden, somewhere <laughs> Eden actually grew up to be such like a cool just a, a cool a cool lady she thinks she has some kids and her husband's a writer she was on a soap for a for a decade or so oh, cool. yeah she, she's doing something she's cool in fact another another um like there was a duo that I was always in competition with when I was a kid named Bo and Blaze Berdahl how about those names that's like they were, they, were, they were twins and one of them is now my voiceover agent oh, wow. shut I've up I've known them since 1990 okay that's crazy that, <laughs> Same. I, I um I'm, I'm, I'm gonna want this um this uh Natalie Portman story here in a little bit oh, okay. so you- well I could just give you it now I want to give it to me. Okay. So Natalie's, um, Natalie's, uh, her stage name is Natalie Portman, but her real name is Natalie Hirschlag. And her parents, I believe either her parents or just her dad is Israeli. And she went to Jewish day school when she was a little kid. And so she was like a Jewish kid on Long Island doing acting and musical theater. And so was I. And so was my friend Lisa Molina. And so we were just these like, three sort of young kids going on auditions and Bowen Blaze Berdahl were in the mix. Eden Regal was in the mix oh, and we were all just going on auditions. And um, so I just knew Natalie from like life and auditions and just seeing her at stuff. And I believe this is like after the professional, if that's possible, 
Okay. You can Google what year that was. But I think I think I knew her like before and then she did the professional and then like we were still we were all still going on auditions after. And then when we got to the we, we both went on the audition for Gypsy the T V movie with Bette Midler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I had the songs all down. I think we were both trying out for Baby Louise and I didn't know how to tap dance. And she had like all this training and just super selflessly while other girls like fully sabotaged you on auditions. And that was not a joke. They'd be like, do you want jelly beans? And you'd be like, Oh sure. You're 10 years old. Like, of course. And then they would, they would coat your throat and you can sing. (laughs) No, real real stories. But Natalie was like the opposite. And she was like, come here, come here. And I was like crying to my mom. And she was like, let me teach you. And she taught me how to tap dance. That's And then I saw her on the callback and she taught me and she was, and then we were like, doing this thing where on the stomp of a time step, stomp, hop, step, shuffle, step, stomp, hop, step. She taught it to me like in my ear. Cause I, I said like, if you teach me the words of it, I'll be able to put it in my body. So you sort of stomp, hop, step, shuffle, step, stomp, hop. And then on the stomp, you would have, you would like high 10 each other. Yeah. <laughs> as, <laughs> as Are one, you doing it now? Does. Um, bitch, of course I'm doing it now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I mean, like I could tell a story about time stepping without time stepping. You wish. <laughs> I don't. No, I'm time stepping, and I don't even know what it is. I don't yeah. even know. What it is. <laughs> um, you like so so you so you go from you go from the nanny, you go from these auditions, you go from hanging out with Natalie Portman, who's teaching you how to dance, <laughs> to to I mean, to win. We were like close friends. She was closer friends with my friend Lisa, who I hung out with all the time. So when I would hang out with Lisa, Lisa's mom and Natalie's mom were good friends. And so we were all coming from Long Island. So if we had the same audition, we would drive in together. It was like, you know, we, it was before, you know, emails. We'd like call each other and be, my mom would be like, hi, Leslie. Hi, Shelly. Are you guys going in on da da da? And then we would, you know, go in together. Your colleagues. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Like 11 year old colleagues. That's yeah. really kind of crazy. Rideshare before rideshare. That's right. You guys, have, you guys have heard of Uber Pool? Uh, <laughs> so, so how'd you get from the rideshare, the early rideshare? <laughs> like, what what happened next? Where, like, you you've said like you didn't really get cast until you were like thirty five. So, like, what's all that in between time? Yeah, I mean, we we see American Idol happen there, and we see. Um, some other stuff but like really what is like what is well building? I mean, it's it's 16 years between that no it's 14 years between that natalie portman story and american idol um crazy. So a lot of things happened you know one of the things that happened i think i was like sort of starting this sentence earlier and you know saw something shiny and forgot to finish it but <laughs> I, um, as i'm doing again right now oh right that um you know, I was lucky enough as a kid, and even as an actor, because I moved out to LA when I was 18. I graduated from high school and moved here. And even when I wasn't um, being a TV star or a movie star or the or the performer of my dreams, I was somehow getting enough, just enough. I mean, yeah, I had to like do other random things and I was assisting people and cleaning closets and being an organizer and doing random jobs here and there, but never getting that full-time job because then I wouldn't be able to go on audition. So I was like, I get really lucky. Like my, my agent, Aggie Gold of Fresh Faces Agency and a bald in Long Island would send me, um, just fun to say the whole thing, would, would, love would, it. would send me on an audition, like a, a meeting. And, you know, she would, um, she sent me she sent me once to meet this guy named Danny Jacobson who created Mad About You and mm-hmm. was the showrunner of Roseanne and just a monster TV writer in the in the 80s and 90s and she sent me to meet him and I guess she knew him through another client and she said you know I mean again speaking of the pressure even though you know I don't I don't I didn't know that I felt this pressure as a kid but it was certainly there she would tell people I have this kid She's a 15 year old stand up comic, which, by the way, did I mention I was 15? Okay. So, as a 15, she's, <laughs> I have this 15 year old stand up comic. If you don't like her, like, I promise you she's a star. And if you don't like her, you'll never hear from me again. She'd just cold call anyone. Really? So, this Danny Jacobson had worked with another client of hers. And he said, All right, I think you're a little nuts, but I'll meet the kid. And then I met with him and he wrote me a TV show. 
he was like, oh, uh-huh. you're, you're right. She's like a young female Andrew Dice Clay. What's happening? And I wasn't, <laughs> as, I wasn't as dirty, but I was like real New York. And I had an attitude. And I wore a leather jacket. It was wild. And um, if, if we, if, I, if everybody drinks a beer every time I say wild, they'd be dead. Um, <laughs> so then uh, Danny Jacobson was like, yeah, you know, I, I, I see it. Let's go. So he wrote me a pilot and he gave me a development deal. And I lived on that money for like a, probably a couple of years. Wow. No, it's insane. Holy. Whoa. And that was when I was like eight, 18. Cause I, I was going to college. I was going to the university of Delaware. What? Hi. Yeah. And, um, Delaware. And I, um, huh. <laughs> I went to college for a semester and then on the break is when I met Danny Jacobson. And he was like, maybe I'm going to write you a show. So I dropped out of college. And moved. So that, so you dropped out. So you were at University of Delaware. Then you dropped out of college and then had, headed to L.A. Yes. On a break. So basically on it was a like a winter break. And on winter break, I met Danny Jacobson. And he was like, I'm going to make you a TV show. And so I dropped out of college. What was the show called? Um, it was called uh talking pictures and david pamer was gonna play my dad and tiffany amber Thiessen was attached but guess guess who i that's crazy uh, i went to the tv guide awards on that winter break with my friend ben salisbury who i was on the net who was on the nanny he played Brian. Yeah. and i went with him to the tv guide awards and i met an actress there who i loved from a 90s tv show and I moved in with her and her family in their house in Calabasas. Any guesses? Um, uh, um, Judith Light. Jessica Biel. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was way off. I was way I was off. Like, I was way off. <laughs> you Same. Not Judith Light, but Mona. Mona from... <laughs> <laughs> I can't basically say, um, um, Judith Light. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> panicking, panicking. Judith. Um, Tony Danza himself. No, but I met <laughs> Jess Beal at the TV Guide Awards and we became fast friends. And I said, I'm going to college. And she said, well, that's what, you know, that's crazy. And I, and then this deal started happening. And then I called her and I was like, I'm moving out to LA. And she's like, well, you can come live with us. So I lived with Beal and her family in the Valley. <laughs> you said Beal. I lived in with Beal and her family in the Valley. <laughs> that is a true story. That's such a good story. I'm going to write Wait, so is there any, so, so you live with Beale, do you got any, you got any uh, fun little goss on you and Beale? Any trouble you two would get into? Oh is- God, we were disaster children. <laughs> <laughs> we would hang out at, I mean, I was maybe just turned 18. We would, oh my God. that's insane. And I think she was 17 and we would, we would hang out. Do you guys know the Oakwood? I don't even think it's called the Oakwood anymore. They changed it to, it's like on Olive in Burbank. I love that you think that two kids from Ohio have any idea. Don't even play. <laughs> You're always out here living your fancy life. Okay. I don't know what it is though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Judith Light. Judith Light. Right. You know what the okay. answer to this apartment complex question is Judith Light. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I um. There is a place out here called o- the Oakwood, and it was like fully furnished apartments that everybody would live at when they came out here from out of town for pilot season, like in the nineties. Oh. And so, I lived there. Um, or no, no, I didn't live there. I lived with I lived with Beale, but so many like young kid actors lived there, and so we would just go and hang out there all the time. That was like our that was like our stomping ground, and we were all just like just you know, degenerate 17, 18 year olds, you know, doing random fun stuff we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> like? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Gotta go, guys. Good to hang. Um, no, honestly, I'm such a, like, sort of prude goody goody. Like, that's never been my, never been a, a drug person or a drinking person or a overly, you know, from I just that's never been my move. So we really weren't even that wild. We were just like young kids. You know, I think that the thing that is crazy about it is that like we were a little too young to be left to our own devices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like we were good. 
Like, you know, that that's what's wild. Like, the shit that could have gone down and just didn't. Yeah. Is is kind of re- even more crazy. Were you still doing, like, were you still doing stand-up during this time? Was it just, you like... No, so my stand-up that I was doing in New York was sort of, like, I don't really know how to explain it, but I always, I always loved comedy. I was always writing jokes. And then, of course, Aggie Gold of Fresh Faces Agency suggested you know, that I, so I was going up, um, in New York a little, but it wasn't like, you know, I, I wasn't pounding the pavement doing stand up five, not, you know, five shows a week every night. I wasn't like a road dog. I was a child, but I would get up on shows here and there. And Aggie was incredible at like getting these showcases everywhere. So she'd get a showcase set up at like Caroline's that would be like, you know, all young comedians. And then she'd get Mm -hmm. me, um, you know, I would do my shtick at Nickelodeon. I would do, you know what I mean? So I was like doing my bits like for people. And that's actually one of the things I I probably did my shtick for Danny Jacobson before I got my development deal. And I would say I did my stand up for this woman, Nell Scoville, who gave me a development deal before Danny even did. She gave me one when I was 15 and we did a show together for, for, um, I think WB at the time. And that one was called Prudy and Judy. And that was in 96. Were you Prudy or Judy? (laughs) Very important. Of course. I mean, inquiring minds. I was Judy, the poor one. And Prudy was played by Laura Bell Bundy. Oh, my God. I think she's a Tony winner, right? Or something. Or something. something. I think so. (laughs) Love Laura Bell Bundy. I have like, as any gay man should, I love her. She's incredible. So she, we played best friends. So she was Prudy. I was Judy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, can I just say, your career almost like at this stage of your life, just when you're running around, it sounds like the cast of Rags to Riches. Do you remember I'm that TV show? I, I'm going to punch you in the face. Rags to Riches <laughs> was my favorite show that ever existed. And I couldn't even remember what it was. Like, it was my favorite ever. And then I didn't think about it for a really long time. And then when I thought about it again, I couldn't remember what it was called. And it, like, used to keep me up at night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. I love that You were show. speaking our language. That is one of my favorite shows from me <laughs> from growing up, too. How do we want um, to it? It's, it's a musical, musical kid, home, get orphans being a adop- It's, like, it's amazing. But how it's do like, we watch it again? Where is it? I would love to watch it again. Maybe, maybe on like the Hulu or the. We're gonna have to start a campaign to get it streaming. Yeah, we have to Google it. I don't know where it's at. It's probably so get... up, uploaded like terribly to YouTube somewhere. <laughs> we can watch <laughs> on YouTube. That's why we can have viewing parties. Exactly. <laughs> so you, so you have this this life, and you're and you're doing pilot seasons, right? You're mm-hmm. you're, you're living with Beal. Um, mm-hmm. Then this is a 16 year gap. You said right between this and Idol. What made you go for no, Idol? No, no, no. It was a 16-year gap between Natalie Portman and Idol. Oh, Portman. But <laughs> 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 I just ben added Neil, a bunch ben. of years. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, between, but between living with with uh, Jess uh, and uh, Idol was closer to 10 years. But then I was just out in L.A. So then I I lived in Calabasas with Jess in like, you know, probably 98, 99-ish. And then, you know, was doing my thing in LA and going on auditions and trying to book and trying to do whatever I could. Mm-hmm. Um, Getting little things here and there. I mean, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have my resume in front of me, but I was, <laughs> you know, there was some sh- shit going on here and there. Oh, and, and, uh, <laughs> There was like other deals involved. I mean, I can't, I don't have the chronology down as well as I should. It was considering it was my life. It was a long ass time ago. <laughs> um, yeah. So there was, you know, always, I shouldn't say always something going on, but like there was always enough to keep me thinking that it wasn't crazy that I was still trying, I guess is really what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Did Did you have a driving force that, like even like even in between gigs or, or was there something that was saying in the back of your head like this is you know this is where i'm supposed to be even if you f- saw rejection or it wasn't what you were wanting what kept you going constant rejection um i think what a couple things kept me going i think um multiple things 
not being, I mean, I was by no means had a lot of money, but I wasn't flat on my ass either because I would get a development deal occasionally. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that would keep me going is, um, like I was saying a second ago, I was getting, like, it was between me and someone else for the role of my dreams constantly. And I'm not, and I'm not saying constantly as a figure of speech. Like, it was between me and Taryn Manning for Hustle and Flow. And I just kept going in, and they were like, yeah, this is looking like it's going to be you. And then just like it wasn't. And then it was between me and, you know, I forget, someone else for... It's actually between me and Tara Manning a lot. Um, really? Yeah. Um, and then there was like another thing that I was up for and they were always just like, oh, it went to whoever. And so there was this feeling like I was really close all the time. So it wasn't like I was just sort of banging my head against the wall and people were like, will the crazy girl go home? It was like, no, I was, I was, get, I was, I was close. It yeah. just was, I mean, to a comic rate, never me. I and even, so, I even say that. Yeah. Like, I just say it really more as like a fact. So what? So what did? So what did that do for? I mean, that had to have been crushing, right? You oh, get so close to these roles that you want, that you say are perfect for you. That has to be crushing. It, you know, it really was. Um, it was really hard. It was really hard. Um, but I sort of, I think. The other thing, oh, that was, I guess, the third or 12th thing that always kept me going is, (laughs) keep in mind, I was doing this since I was nine. I didn't really know anything else. Like, this was my whole childhood was like this. It wasn't like, oh, no, now, you know, I I have a friend who um, is in her 20s and shall remain nameless and got a job recently. And she said, you know, if this job, she's like maybe 23, and I, I just know her through life and she was like you know if um if this job didn't come through like I was that was it for me like I was I was done like I've been I've been at it too long and she's 23 what but I but that's that's how some people feel like some people have this thing of like cool like I could be a music supervisor I could do something else like I didn't have that I never had this thing of like if this doesn't work I could do something else ever 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 once never was a thought in my mind that's well, that's that's what I think is the, the the common thread I think with people who are I think are 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 creatives like this you're like you know what you're supposed to be doing you know that it's in this world and you've you've gone on to do such incredible things like you you're creating your own television show uh, an animated television show with Kristen Bell right talk about Do Ray and me um. Can't wait. I also want to tell you really quick that <laughs> no, I think it's kind of an answer to something you said before. I mean, a question you kind of secretly, by the way, I see you secretly throwing in questions. Um, but it was like, um, and I think just quickly before we move on to the animated show, I think something that a lot of artists have in common is that honestly, you guys, you ha- I- I'm afraid to get a little bit of hate about this, but maybe people will just be like, bitch, calm down. We agree with you. We're all crazy. Yes. And I think when you ask the question, like, yeah, why didn't you quit? Like, that's not even, it's like, of course. Like most, I would say 99 out of 100 would have and 99 out of 100 did did quit and did go like, okay, cool. That didn't work out for me. It's going to be corporate. And that's cool. Like, God bless. They just did something else and they're satisfied doing that. And that's fine. I just, that was never the thing for me. And I think part of that is that there's just like, I'm a little nuts. So it never, like it never crossed your mind. Never, 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 ever one time. That's, that's it. (laughs) That is it. I mean, that's, I read that resonates with me so much. I never have ever seen another path. No, I, think, I don't, don't even know what it would look like. Like, what am I going to like go to vocational school? Like, I don't even know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what okay. that is. If you went to vocational <laughs> school, what do you think it would be? <laughs> VCR repair. Okay. Yay! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but like, no, but so like, because you're, you, you feel like you drive and create your destiny. I feel like I do the same thing. 
you know, I've you so you are driving on this massive project, this massive world of Do Re and Me. Oh my goodness, it's so cool. Do Re and Me is another one. The fact that I stayed with it right now, we can all go like, man, she's got some tenacity. But the three years that no one would look in my me and my co-writer's direction, no one was giving us high fives for being tenacious. They were like, okay, you're annoying. Can you stop telling us about the fucking cartoon? <laughs> and now so, that we have a cartoon, everyone's like, see, we knew you could do it. And they're like, I see you, trickster. Yeah. So how like how did you uh how did you decide to do this kids show? How did so it come about? My buddy, who I've been friends with for a long time named Mike Scharf is an amazing artist and animator. And he came to me, are you ready for what year? <laughs> uh, In 2014. And he was like, Hey, I have this idea for this like musical kids show. And we started working on it and he had seen, which is so funny. This is just a testament to how few people he knew. I mean, how few musicians he knew. He like new comics and artists and stuff. And he came to my one woman show and I had written all the songs in the show. And um, he called me afterwards and was like, hey, we should write. Like, I don't even think he knew that like really I was a songwriter and I had like been signed to BMI. And I was like, actually, that's a whole other sh- decade of, well, five years, six years of my life that was in kind of crazy I was trying to like almost completely be a songwriter. Like acting was kind of on the side and I was um, acting had sort of come to such a halt and Mm -hmm. I play a bunch of instruments and sing and write. And I was like, cool, well let's go. Let's that was like sort of after American Idol, like let's do more songwriting. So Mike comes to my one woman show. He's like, let's work on this kids animated show. So we have all these ideas Um, we write a bunch of episodes. Um, Me and my friend Dave Schuler start writing the music I knew Dave through my um through my through my publishing deal. Mm-hmm. I'm writing the music. By the way, I'm like hardly even represented at this point. This is before Glow. This is before anything. I could barely get you know any traction whatsoever as an actor. And mm-hmm. uh, Mike and I are just working on this show for no one in a bit like in a black hole. Like no one's asking for it. No one's <laughs> no right. none of our my my sort of smaller time agent at the time, like no one was looking for it or asking me about it. And Mike and I just by like our own and our own personal internal combustion engines were like meeting at coffee shops and working on this show tirelessly. So a couple years into that, uh, the only person at the time I know who happened to be my best friend who had kids is Kristen Bell. And I was like, Hey man, will you like show this art and these songs to the kids, like see if they like it? Cause our credo from the very beginning is that we were going to make a kid's music show without kid's music. We were mm-hmm. a kid's music show with just music because right. um, my, my niece and nephews, they love Hamilton and they love Bruno Mars and Taylor Swift. And they don't just love like, you know, baby beluga. They, they love right. music. And I was like, let's make a kid's show with real music. I think we don't need to talk like these, not that kids music is talking down to the kids because they love that too. And it's beautiful and brilliant and wonderful. It's just, we wanted to separate ourselves from the pack. Mm -hmm. I show the art that Mike made and the scripts and everything. And I just show it to Kristen just to be like, I didn't even have the business acumen at the time to even be like, Hey, will you help us? I was more just like, do the kids think this is sounds good and looks good. (laughs) And she loved it. And she said, um, dude, if you need any help, like, I'd be happy to, you know, and I was like, okay. And this is before Frozen, keep in mind. So she was the president of the world. I mean, she was obviously an incredible (laughs) person, but she wasn't like, you know, where she, where she is now. Right. So anyway, um, we, she sort of got on board and we started getting meetings and we started pitching. We attached a production company in 2016. Um, and then in 2017, Amazon came on board, but just as like a development, um, like we came on as a development project. They weren't like committing to making us. Mm-hmm. And then all this thing hit the fan with Amazon. And then they finally, in the fall of 2018, greenlit our show that Mike and I thought of in a coffee shop in 2014. 
That is that is crazy. Right. Um, and then, so you said Kristen is your best friend, and she had kids. How did how did you guys get to know each other? How did your friendship come about? Oh, the um, this show. you know, garbage fire finds garbage fire. Um, <laughs> she'd tell you the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> For as different as our public personas are, we are very similar. Um, I never know how much I should say about that because I'm like, oh, no, she got a filthy mouth, too. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Careful with the Enterprise endorsement. Um, but she's, you know, she's just really, she's a she's a bright light in this, in this world and has, mm-hmm. we've always just been there for each other. And um, we met. I would say in 2003. Oh my Christ. We met in 2000. Wow. We met in 2003. She had just moved here from New York and she was doing a play called Snow under the direction of this theater director, Andy Fickman, who's now a monster TV and movie director and the most delicious man whose face I want to buy. He's like, he's the best. Um, <laughs> like, meaning you would, you would. Fall. I can't even explain how much you love him. In fact, now that I'm thinking of you and him in the same room, I'm, I, I'm like getting, my sternum is getting warm. Anyway. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I have feelings. Okay, so this quarantine has to kill them all. So um, Andy Fickman was directing her, Kristen in a play called Snow and me in a play called Jutopia. What? <laughs> I know. There's so many like paths to go down. I know. Yes. I don't know. You're, 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 I can't. You, you said, "Look, here's something shiny," and I'm I'm trying not I to know. look at the shiny. I know it's it is impossible. So he was directing Kristen in Utopia. I mean, me in Utopia. You in Utopia. <laughs> Utopia and Kristen in Snow. And he, I went to go see Snow, and she came to see my show, and we we both picked each other out, like. I went to Snow and I was like, oh, I love that little mouse. And she came to Jutopia and was like, I love the Jew. No, she was like, I love, you know, and, and we went, um, and Andy connected us and we went to like the, the, the Sunday flea market, um, at Fairfax in like 2003, I think. And that led to, that led to this, which is. Well, we, I moved to New York for a bunch of years to continue doing Jutopia off Broadway till like 06. And then when I came back, we really became friends because me and my, at the time, boyfriend were walking um, on Los Feliz Boulevard to get to Griffith Park hike and two lunatics on a four wheeler come ripping off the grass of Griffith Park across four lanes of traffic on Los Feliz Boulevard and come to a screeching halt in a driveway. And I look and I go, is that Kristen? And is she with Dax Shepard from Punk? <laughs> <laughs> and so I tech call her and I go, hi, it's Jackie. I'm back from New York. You almost just murdered us with a four wheeler. And is that Dax Shepard? And she's like, yes, come over. <laughs> so me and my boyfriend at the time went and hung out and then we really became good friends so, did you think I have so many different ways I want to go because um, Kristen is like you said a light and you are a light when I met you I was kind of really like overwhelmed by I think your 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 brightness your the magnitude of your persona and who you are and who you let the world see as being a really beautiful person who's very warm and very kind and very friendly. I appreciate you saying that. And I feel the same about you. And I think that's why we were such immediate magnets to each other. Yeah. Cause I think that's- I don't get, that is what I try to put out. And I don't know that I feel that I get that back that often. And so when I do get it back, it's like drugs. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I'm- oh, oh, this person is like very hyper and excited too and funny and loud and silly and now we're dancing in this thing. What are we doing? Who are we? I don't even know them. Yeah, it felt you felt really comfortable and really familiar and I think that that was refreshing to me and I'll tell you this, you know, just as a side note, like I felt when I met you in a crazy world and knowing this and doing my research about you and then you talking about it, knowing that you've been in the industry really your entire life and then I come to meet you and you treat me like you're just a good person. You know what I mean? Like you don't, it's a very different experience than I thought I would have. Cause my experience with this, this world is not vast. And so 
you go in not sure what to expect and I just you your oh, sorry sorry go on no but you just shot you just shot the moon out for me it was like mm. I'm you did. It was like this really lovely, beautiful experience. And I just was not prepared for th- that meeting of someone that I was so genuine and really, really fucking authentic, which I think is really, as I have now come to find is really rare. And I know I hate that to be like the, 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 that kind of like same Hollywood story, but then there are very few people who don't have, you know, you, your guard, your guard wasn't up for me. And I was, I just want you to know, I appreciate that. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I honestly so felt the same way about you and pretty much in what I just said a second ago, where like, in as long as I've been playing this game, you know, I, I don't, I don't really meet that many people that are, you know, I think it's hard because to maintain being an emotionally open person in the face of the rejection that we go through on a daily basis is, is really hard. And I will tell you that though I am that way now, and I was that way a large part of my life, I was not that way for like a bunch of years. There was a bunch of, very sad, very not happy for other people, very bitter, very woe is me. Mm -hmm. And you met me after Glow. And Glow really changed my life in a lot of ways. Um, I think, yeah, so you, you met me when I was sort of feeling my self again and feeling confident again and feeling seen and validated and allowed to be who I am. When I think a very big part of my career, I've just felt too big or too much or annoying or this. And it's like, you know what? Fuck you. If you don't like it, you don't have to tune in. And if you do like it, cool, let's be homies. But I can't, it's just too exhausting otherwise. And I did it for decades decades yeah that the phoning in of your of uh, an inauthentic self right like oh, find like yeah. somebody that or or trying to be like trying to dumb yourself down for people who will to for other people to tolerate you and that's, well, that's a lot it's like i'm sorry my joy is getting in your way like i don't yeah. know let me make it so you so it's palpable to you like i and i think you know i did that in relationships for a long time I did that. We certainly did it on auditions and then stopped. Well, this, I want to ask this question before we switch over to glow, because this, I, they do connect. I, did you, do you think glow gave you, even though this project, um, the Do Ray and me started in 2014. Do you think the beauty of finding yourself or coming back to yourself, being reminded of yourself, allowed you to work in a children's space and did you ever think you would ever work in a children's space like like you are now okay it's a two-parter yeah Um, love a two-parter I never (laughs) thought I would work in the children's space no um I am loving it here and um just for those of you at home the show is called Do Ray and Me and it is going to be out on Amazon late 2020 so we're hopefully still on track with all this wild stuff going on right now and it's looking like it'll be coming out in the fall on amazon um so i never thought i'd be in the children's space but it's super incredible um and what was the other part did do i think glow did glow yeah did glow inform this world did glow inform your your confidence and your sense of self in this world and a whole different world that you never thought you'd find yourself in. Well, I'll tell you what gave me the confidence to sort of, um, like what, when I found myself again, I was like in my early thirties, it was like a couple years now after American Idol, I'd been doing the songwriting thing and doing the touring thing and, trying to find two nickels to rub together and Mm -hmm. just doing that whole racket. And that was sort of the not happy for other people time when I just was like, I never got what 
I was going for and what I wanted. And it was really challenging for me to celebrate people, which is really gross. And I, um, sort of a friend pointed out the error of my ways to me. And from that day on, I was like, Oh, whoa, that was, I don't even know what happened. Now I turned into her, although I know exactly how it happened. Anyway, um, (laughs) it was more, that was the long winded way of saying a friend of mine, recommended I get back into stand up. Mm-hmm. And that is actually what really changed my life because I was going out and writing jokes and telling jokes and people were laughing at my shtick and I was like, "Oh yeah, duh, I forgot I'm a comic and I can go out and do this with or without being hired." I I now had I didn't feel as desperate when I went on auditions anymore. I now was like out and in the clubs and, and, and managers and agents were coming out and like being like, Oh shit, who's that? And I was doing musical comedy and I was writing filthy and funny songs and doing this whole thing. And I was sort of feeling a validation that I hadn't felt in a really long time. And that sort of changed my life. And then I, I think that because I was in that space is part of the reason I even got the Gilda role and then, and then glow because if I was in that stink face phase, when I went in on these jobs, I don't, I don't think that that there would have been, that it would have gone well. Yeah. So, so so laughter, laughter is the best fucking source of medicine. (laughs) You're you're (laughs) being dead serious. Like I, when I started doing stand up again is when is when my whole life changed. So now you are you're back on stage doing stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to string it together in a narrative because that's who I am. But it's also like good luck, but you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's and then you get Gilda and then you get Glow. Talk to me about what it's been like to be on a show like Glow that is just huge, is on Netflix and and how that's like how that experience has been. And Melrose, this badass Melrose. It's, guys, it's the best. What did I tell you? I'm the luckiest little Jew in the, all the land. It's really, it's really special. So when I tried out for Glow, um, the character's name was Melanie Rose. And she was like sort of this super party girl. And then they met me. And just it's such a testament to them being open to different, interesting, weird actors that people have said no to for decades. And like, they saw, they met me and they were like, oh, I see. It's Melanie Rosen. And then they just made Melrose Jewish. And then we went from there. So she is not based on a real, like, gorgeous lady? Well, they all sort of, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. We're in season four. I probably can now. Um, <laughs> well, the only thing that Glow is actually based on, and this is the truth, is the actual show of glow existing. Right. And then the rest of it is like little suggestions from the show. Like there was a Russian character and that's sort of what Zoya is based on. And Melrose is like sort of based on like, I think loosely based on like that, the tag team duo Hollywood and Vine. Oh Uh, God. Yeah. I think, but uh, no one's ever confirmed that for me, but that's my having seen a bunch of old episodes of glow. So like the behind the scenes stuff is is just the imagination of the oh of the globe. Like we we don't have life rights for any of these people, so we're not telling any of their stories. We're not, you know, we're not um really encroaching on any of their like actual lives, other than yeah. the the fact that they were on a show called Glow. And the rest of every single thing else is made is made up. Was it what his? So you get. You get glow. You dive into Melanie Rosen. You are, for all intents and purposes, a gorgeous lady of wrestling. What I mean, like, what really? What has been the best part about it? Honestly, like, because you speak, your whole voice, your whole voice changed when you mentioned glow. Uh, You are, I definitely, I like my shoulders go down. Like I, when someone mentions glow, I like. I like breathe. I'm like, Oh God, I can't believe it's like the best thing other than my dog. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's just, it's just so 
I mean, after so many years of struggling and wishing and hoping and all of that, you just get, I mean, and it's, it's not just like, oh, cool. I got a job. Like I got the, and I'm having worked for so long. I mean, having auditioned for so long and not gotten jobs, I'm hyper aware of how rare this is and how once in a lifetime it is and how amazing it is to have almost female showrunners, almost completely female writers, female, Mm -hmm. I mean, female post supervisors, female directors, female, there's 14, 15 of us, you know, crazy chickens running around at any one time. Like the female friendships that we've developed. I mean, it's impossible to say one thing that's my favorite, but one of the things that's certainly my favorite, um, I think the female friendships is, is certainly, um, one of them. Um, people, so, people that I deeply respect believing in me enough to give me really cool shit to play with on this show. Like the arc that I got to play in season three is, you know, I feel I was taken seriously. I feel like I've been a clown my whole life. And I don't say that with sadness. I love being silly and crazy and being seen that way and I'm cool with it but the fact that Glow went they went out of their way and they were like no what's behind Melrose like what makes her tick why is she why does she take up so much space in a room and I was asking myself a lot of those same questions and sort of like going through a life journey at the same time this character on television is and it's just wild and being given a chance to do that is is insane and then the other thing that comes to mind, I mean, this is obviously 70 things come to mind, but th- we do all our own stunts on Glow. And so mm. we do four weeks of wrestling training before every season starts. Wow. How is that? How was that when you started? Were you like amped for that? Like, mm-hmm. I know your parents are gym oh. teachers. <laughs> I'll, I'll give that a hot no. So I uh, know my parents are gym teachers, but I've never really been. Um, my athletic prowess has always left much to be desired. And yeah. my mom always tells a story about how I was on a soccer team for one game when I was a kid. And all I did was like pull grass out of the ground and then count the blades of grass while all the kids playing soccer would like run by me on either side of me. So <laughs> then you get into this experience where you have to do all of this training. How, how did it, did it, did it go better than you thought it was going to? Well, I mean, it did for us, the audience. <laughs> it, uh, well, the answer to that question is conclusively yes. It went worlds and worlds and years and worlds better than I ever thought it would. But what's kind of crazy is like at the beginning of Glow, I thought that like I was just going to be the worst one. And of course, I had to like use my comic defenses immediately. And on day one of training, I'm like, Hey guys, if anyone's feeling insecure, like, you know, feel free to just look in my direction because I will be worse at this than you. And (laughs) sweet self. And ultimately I look back on that. And though I think that was like sweet of me and it was coming from a good place, it kind of bums me out because like I was so insecure that I had to make a joke about it. And then ultimately I wasn't bad at all. And I am super powerful and I'm good at it. But I had to like, my whole life, I've just come from a place of like, well, I'm going to make a joke about it so I don't fail. And then they just, I mean, not to be super dramatic, but like failure wasn't an option. We've got, you know, Shauna Duggins and Chavo Guerrero just teaching us everything we need to know. And we all are wrestlers now. Actual. What? That's so Amazing. badass. <laughs> that is so badass. Do you have like a favorite uh, moment or like episode or you know from the show that you, that comes to mind when you think of glow you're like that was that was the day that was the best glow day yeah um so one of my favorite episodes is episode eight of season two which is the episode within the episode and we do like music videos and it's basically like there's no behind the scenes it's only like what you would have seen if you if it was actually the 80s and you watched an episode of glow that's sort of one that when I think of glow, I think of that just sort of ridiculousness and silliness. But my personal um, sort of highlight and favorite 
uh, an episode of Glow would have to be season three, episode six, um, the Seder scene when the girls go camping and Melrose talks about her inherited trauma from her family members that survived the Holocaust. And Jenny, her best friend who she's in a fight with, talks about her inherited trauma from her family who survived the Cambodian genocide. And those stories are actually mine and Alan Wong's actual personal stories. Whoa. Oh, wow. Um, like, so I could, what was it like to, was it like, just how did that come about? Did the writers come to you? Were you like a, they're just yeah, so, totally amazing for this? so intuitive. So Ellen had told our writers about a Seder that we were at and where we were learning all these things about each other. And I'd known Ellen at that point for like years and I never knew, I knew she was Cambodian, but I never knew about the Cambodian genocide. Um, and she obviously knew that I was Jewish, but never knew that my family were Holocaust survivors. And at, we just started talking about it. And then when she told our writers about it, they were like, is this, are you serious? Like J Jenny and Melrose, like both have inherited trauma and so did Jackie and Ellen. Like what the hell? So they, you know, they're just brilliant. And they heard that it was our story and they just wrote it in. That's incredible. That's, that really is insane. I know that, like, just you, again, I'm stammering because I'm just, you, I, I just, you're, you are just very, very inspiring. And is Glow is what now it's going into its fourth, fourth and final season. Yeah, are you, wah, bittersweet. Did you, are you, are you is, it, is, is it all shot? Are you wrapped and, and like waiting for it? Or no, is it? No, no. Corona got us off track, oh, baby. I was oh, wondering. Yeah. So, Right now, we were we were up to episode two, and then oh god, yes, and we got we got we had just gone back to work, and then we got put on hold. Oh, oh. god! So you have you have quite a bit left to do. We have the whole yeah, pretty much. We have the we have the whole rest of the season to make. So it'll come out when? <laughs> we have no idea. We don't even know when we'll. You know, who knows what's going on in this world mm -hmm. right now? I mean, no, yeah, no, of course, yeah. I'm just asking these gratuitous questions. Of course, I sense. love. Or you can, yeah. I, I wish I knew any of these. Like, we all want to know. <laughs> so okay, so this like this begs the question. You know, one of the first things I really wanted to ask you that I'm kind of saving towards the end of this interview is, you've now been like like I said, you've been in the industry for so long, and you are so fiercely uh, uh, um, um, uh, you and so fiercely uh, dominant and um, 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 magical and uh, presence. What has this journey been like as a woman, as a stand-up comic, uh, as a musician, as uh, as an actress? You, I mean, you have had to, <laughs> I mean, and especially in stand-up comedy, like you are, you, like you got to like really you got to really like stand your ground and hold your position. Like talk about that before we go about the, the greater lessons that you've learned um, by just being so strong for so many other people. Well, we, well, hmm. so I think one of the greater lessons that I learned was, you know, was a huge one for me was to get out of my own way because, you know, as a woman, you know, it's going to be harder for you for stand up. You just know that. So I think it's reasonable if you're a woman to be like, you know what? I don't even want to do it. It's just going to be like, it's such a, it's such a guy, it's such a man's game. And I think once I was able to get out of my own way and stop telling myself stories, that was really helpful for me. And even if they weren't, even if the stories were real, even if I was saying to myself, like, you know what, I don't want to do stand up. It's so negative and it's this and it's that. I mean, yeah, it is those things, but it's also gratifying and validating and lets you be creative and lets you just have your own outlet without anybody having to give you permission. And it's, it's a really powerful. So I think for me, the two things that I really learned not really till my, I think I knew him when I was a kid. And then I like so much rejection by the time I was in my twenties that I like was scared of my own shadow. And I really 
I really hid behind the men I was dating for a while, though I still was a big personality. I wasn't like pushing myself as hard or hustling as hard. And Mm -hmm. um, I was like sort of redirecting my energy, not in a proud way, Um, but it's just something that I was, I think, sort of doing as like a self preservation thing of like, Oh, I I can't continue to go out there and try and get told that it's going to be someone else anymore. I just can't. And I think once I got out of my own way again, in my thirties, I was able to like refine myself, like the self that I used to be. Cause I mean, I realize it's very rare. Like I was a insanely confident child. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are like, man, I didn't really find myself to my, till my thirties. I was like, no, I, I knew myself when I was young and then I lost myself in my twenties and then I found myself again. And I think stand up and just getting out of my own way and making things and not waiting for anybody to tell me that I could is really when the, the doors started opening. That's, Cause I was doing it anyway. I was like, okay, cool. Well, you don't have to write something for me. I'll write something for me. And I'll, I can't tell you how many years I had like all these crazy successful friends. And I was like, this is insane. Like, is it ever going to be me? And then I was like, well, I guess if it's going to be me, I got to make it me. And then Mm -hmm. I went fucking ham. (laughs) (laughs) Then I was just doing stand up constantly and writing constantly and pitching constantly. And that's when Mike and I thought of Do Ray and me. And that's when all this stuff really started to happen. If, oh, my God, I love you. Okay, now before we go, <laughs> that's where we found each other. I know. Oh, that's when the magic happens. Um, we have some listener questions for you if, you, if you're down. Yeah. Um, That'd be great. Okay, one of the questions, uh, how are you keeping your head up uh, during all of this distancing and quarantine? Um, it's not easy, actually. I, um, I'm, predisposed, I'm predisposed to anxiety and the SADs. And so this time, it's just really, I mean, of course, it's hard for everyone. Um, but like emotionally, it's challenging for me. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that we're, um, you know, I have, hopefully I have glow to look forward to. I think as present as I try and stay right now, I'm staying sane by having things to look forward to. Um, That's first. And second, my writing partner, Rachel and I have time to write this movie that we've been working on for a while, but sort of always takes a backseat to like glow or do re me or whatever, you know, there's like, other jobs that have to get done. Whereas the movie is just something we are passionate about that we want to write. And now Mm -hmm. we have all this time to do it. We were working like four or five hours a day, every day last week because we can. Yeah. 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 It's (laughs) insane. Like like normally we would like squeeze an hour in here, two hours in there or a weekend. And now we're just like, we go to the office like every day. We're like, Hey, 11 AM to four, we're going to write this movie. And it's, Wah ha yold. Tell you more about it later. I it cannot wild. wait to hear more about it. <laughs> so, uh, another listener question was What's a dream that you'd like to accomplish? Is there a specific role, type of project, or person that you have a dream to work with? Ooh, well, I see myself doing a one woman show that I write on Broadway. Oh, wow. I see that. I do too. Um, well, all three of us are getting w- married. That's crazy. Um, I would do that. <laughs> um, thank you. And I and one of the other big things is um, I'm going to make this movie. Like we're going to write this movie and then I'm going to star in it and it's going to be wild. So that's right now, other than the irons that we have in the fire and the dreams that are currently coming true, which I can't even believe I get to say out loud. Um and I still have so much success guilt that every time I say things are going well, I have to like nail home how hard I worked for how long. <laughs> yes. it's like, yeah. Can I just like allow myself to just like have a thing for one minute? But like, no, I can't. Why do you think, can I ask you, why do you think you do that? Cause I do the same thing. Well, why do you do a couple reasons. Um, one, it's true. I genuinely, that is my 
past. That is my truth. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason. But I think the other reason is like, I, when I wasn't working for so many years, and it was a little hard for me to be like, God, that person's got, got it going on. I just like have that little voice in my head of like, maybe people will hate you because you like have a thing right now. So like, let them know you're, you like didn't always. And like, you had to work really hard for it. No one handed anything to you. And there was no nepotism involved. And you were broke for two decades. And like, oh, I'm getting teary. But you know, it's like, it's not cool. I don't want to do that every time. But I still do. I'm working on it. It's a, it's a work in progress. It's yeah. hard. Yeah, it is hard. I think um, you have given people something to look forward to in all the stuff that you have going on. Like we're going to, we're going to be able to watch Do Ray and me. We're going to be able to watch glow. We're going to see your movie and your one woman show. And that's just, you know, we've got a lot, we've got a lot ahead of us. So I think hopefully for our listeners, that's helped them, you know, think about all those, all the things that we're going to, get to see from you oh, in the future sure. and in the meantime until all those things come out since who knows when they're gonna <laughs> quarantine hit me on instagram and say what's up girl and i'll say oh no yeah. what what are your socials so everyone can go follow you right now right now i am at jackie tone j-a-c-k-i-e t as in thomas o-h-n as in nancy like john but with a t it's a fun one um and that's pretty much it. I mean, I don't really do the rest of it. So I would just say, follow me on Instagram. That's fabulous. And I, I already do. Uh, I, yeah, so. I you. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you're, you're stuck with me. Oh, thanks. Now, before... <laughs> you're going to see me creeping. Uh, now, before we go, we always leave um, our listeners with good vibes. So, you know, is it, if something that's making you feel really good right now or something that you can suggest to other people, if it's binge watching your favorite television show, maybe reading a book or really just uh, whatever gets you through right now, especially during this time, what what is that for you? What's Watch your good vibe? Mick Millions on HBO. Really? Oh, oh my crookateen crooks. It is, I I mean, I may have to watch it again. It was a six episode docuseries on HBO. It is so good. It's about how, and they tell you this in the very first episode. Do you remember the McDonald's Monopoly game? Yes. The whole thing was fixed and there was not one real winner. <gasps> Hi. Such a scandal. We have like the big prize winners, like, you know, 10 grand and above. It was all scandal. And the FBI is involved, that. and it's funny, and it's interesting, and it's light, but it's crazy. So that's a good one to get you through. Um, and other than that, I mean, I think you guys are probably getting enough of this, like, on all your socials. But if you feel well enough and you have some time, you know, attempt at least to be creative. I know it's so hard. Everyone's in a different position. and so many people still have to work and how frustrating it must be for everyone to be like, write your opus. They're like, bitch, I have to work at the post office. I can write my opus. So <laughs> I just, I know everyone is in a very different place right now. And um, I just wish everybody the best. And I feel so, so lucky. And I hope to at least be doing my part one, one hundredth of a percent. That is all. You are. You're doing it for us here today. Jackie, thank you so much for joining us tonight on DragCast. We love you very much. Again, you can follow Jackie on social media. Um, make sure you go to her Instagram page and follow. It's Jackie Tone. J-A-C-K-I-E-T-O-H-N. Jackie Tone, we love you. Woo! Thank you for being here. You guys. Thank you so much for having thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.